name of Jesus, amen. Will you pray with me? Father of grace and mercy, we thank you that you have drawn us to yourself through the waters of baptism. Keep our identity in you clear, that in all we do, we may live in your grace and mercy and point to you. Bless us now in the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 1996, there was a new church plant. It was not an LCMS church. It was planted in Seattle. The church was called Mars Hill. And it didn't take very long before it gathered the attention of all people looking at church things. This church prided themselves on being a light in the darkness in one of the most unchurched cities in the United States. The church grew quickly. It gathered people. The church continued to be a model that other churches would follow. But unfortunately, as quickly as it grew, it also spun out of control and closed. As quickly as Mars Hill grew, they expanded staff, they expanded facilities. But yet in 2014, the church collapsed. The pastor resigned. The leadership left. The pastor and much of the leadership fell prey to the perils of power and success and pride. Since the end of Mars Hill, a lot of people have been combing over the wreckage in the leadership. They've been looking at the debris field of broken trust, broken relationships, and sometimes even broken faith to understand what happened. How did this huge church break down and disintegrate so quickly? Many conclude one of the chief factors was narcissism in the leadership. A complete inward focus that promotes self above above anything else. Narcissism, honestly, is just a symptom. The misplacing of their baptismal identity for power and success was the root cause. The pastor and the leadership, they all lost their focus on what was most important. They lost the focus on who's doing the work of saving. They lost their focus that Jesus is the Savior, the only Savior that came into the world to die for us, for sinners, that we might live free and in his grace and mercy. Instead, the church began to promote the pastor. The church began to promote their presence in the community and all of the people that were gathering there in worship. The message of Christ, and he alone crucified for us, for our forgiveness, was lost. It was hidden. It was distorted, and it was, it was overcome by egos and kingdom building. The story of Mars Hill is a painful reminder of what happens when our identity is not in Christ alone. Instead, when it turns to me, when it turns to myself, when it turns to what I can make myself, or worse yet, when our identity becomes something that society pushes upon us, we lose Christ and that hope and promise that we have that he has forgiven us. If someone would say to you, tell me about yourself, how would you start out? Most of the time, we start out with something that identifies us and gives us value. Well, I'm a carpenter. I'm an administrative assistant. I'm the head of the football team or head of the cheerleading squad. I'm the captain of the football team. We identify ourselves by what we think gives us value or by what other people might find value in. We really like to identify ourselves by our occupation. In the United States, do you know the group that has the largest suicide rate? It's not teenagers. It's single men over the age of 65. They find their value in their work, their purpose in their work. And when they retire and they are no longer identified by what they do, 
they find themselves lost. They struggle with depression caused by retirement. When the identity of what they did is gone, they feel hollow and incomplete because their identity is wrapped up in what they do. The same trap can happen to the church. If our identity is wrapped up in how fast we're growing, if it's I, our identity is wrapped up in how many people are coming to church, then it won't take long and our identity will betray us. It won't take long and our identity will be driven by our pride and our ego and our human ambition. If our identity as a church is in the slick online presence that we have, or how cool our pastors are, which you don't have to worry about, by the way. <laughs> if our identity is in the programs we have or how well we feed the community or our youth group, when one of those dynamics change, the church will be in a tailspin because it's lost its identity. It's lost its focus and its identity was never Christ at the center for you for the forgiveness of sins. When our baptismal identity as a sinner who is totally and completely forgiven by Jesus' death on the cross is misplaced, often our identity is replaced by our sin. Today I identify as a man or a woman or both. Please refer to me with the pronouns they or them. I'm LGTBQ. I'm an atheist. And suddenly our identity is driven by the very things that will separate us from the gifts of God and from his eternal hope and forgiveness. John the Baptist didn't have any problem at all with identity. He confessed clearly, I am not the Christ. When the Pharisees came asking him, who are you? It would have been real easy for John to ride on the coattails of Jesus. I'm his cousin. I'm the forerunner. But John didn't do that. John knew who he was. He was not even worthy to do the job of the lowest slave in the house, which was to take the shoes off the guests. John knew who he was, and he knew who Jesus was. The Lamb of God that comes to take away the sin of the world. Look, Jesus is the Son of God. He confessed, and he did not deny, but he confessed completely when they asked him, I am not the Christ. John says, I'm not the Christ, clearly. And he points to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John wants those who question him and his identity to see Jesus as their Savior and their Lord and their hope and their promise. When John is asked if he's Elijah, the Old Testament prophet, who is to come before the Messiah comes, John says, I am not Elijah. He didn't take any credit. He didn't try to, to draw any power from the Old Testament powerful prophet. When John was asked if, if he was the prophet that is to come, a reference back to someone who would come that would be greater and more powerful than Moses, John's answer was the same. I am not. John simply said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. You see, John was clear. He knew who he was. He was a sinner, but he lived in the grace and the promise of God sending a Messiah in the world. And when he was in the womb of his mother and was standing there in the presence or being carried there in the presence of his mother, John jumped in the womb in front of Jesus. John knew who he was. He was simply one doing this. Pointing to Jesus, pointing to the hope, pointing to the Messiah that would come into the world to forgive us all of our sins. John knew who he was. He was the law, pointing people to repent so that they could clearly see the hope of Jesus coming into the world for them. 
Because John lived in his redeemed, forgiven identity so well, he was not seeking prominence. He was not looking for accolades. His value and identity was not in what he did. It was in what Christ had done for him. John wanted everyone, all of us, to see Jesus, to know his love and his mercy, to know the great lengths that Jesus would go to so that you, dear children of God, would live in forgiveness and peace. John wanted us to know that this Christ that he pointed to was the same promise that God made in the Garden of Eden that he would send one that would crush Satan's head. John pointed clearly to Jesus, his hope and our hope. Sin and death would be atoned for completely by the perfect, sinless Lamb of God. John lived confidently in his redeemed and forgiven identity as a child of God. He confessed clearly, I am not the Christ. And so have we, by the way. Because of our, because of our baptismal identity that faithed us and connected us to the one John points to, we are bold to confess. I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities. You see, like John, we have confessed that we are not the Christ. That we are broken by sin. But we look and find our hope in the one that John pointed to. The very words that were given to us that we are forgiven because of Christ. You see, our identity is not in who we are. It is not in what we do. It is not in our sin. It's in our Savior who gives us the hope that by his death and resurrection, we are forgiven all of our sins. Everything that's rooted in Christ and finds its identity in Christ alone will point back to him. This wonderful sanctuary that we are so privileged to worship in confesses Christ. When you stand at the back and you walk toward the sanctuary, the very first thing you see is the cross. It boldly fills the room. It demands our attention and it confesses we preach Christ crucified for us, for the forgiveness of sins. As we gather here in this place, the cross is above the altar. So that the gifts from the cross flow through his altar out to us. His word preached to us today that reminds us of our baptismal identity that we are Christ's. And we are covered by his blood on the cross and we are forgiven. As we walk this morning to the altar rail to receive the Lord's Supper, we walk by the baptismal font. We are reminded that right there, Christ faithed us through the Holy Spirit. Gave you faith to believe. Connected you to the cross of Christ. Gave you an identity, not as the Christ, but as one that the Christ loved and died for and forgave. When we gather around this semicircle communion rail, it confesses that as we gather here, all of those who have gone before us, angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, gather at the other side of this circle in heaven seeing the Lamb on the throne as we receive the very body and blood of Christ in our mouths and in our bodies. Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and the fourth Sunday of Advent confesses that Jesus is Christ as well. It's the last Sunday before we celebrate the Nativity, the Incarnation, God taking on human flesh and blood and dwelling among us. The season of Advent confesses clearly, your King, your Savior, your Messiah comes to you. Not to destroy you, not to punish you, not to make life miserable and give you lots of laws to follow, but to fulfill the law, to give you peace and forgiveness, to be your hope and your promise. You see, everything that's rooted in Christ confesses Christ, just like John, 
And just like we do living in our baptismal identity. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace that passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.